Hi guys, in this video we will be talking about the effects of industrialization. We are going to be describing the effects of the Industrial Revolution. We will be explaining how the Industrial Revolution led to political, economic, and social changes in Europe. We will be identifying important changes in human life caused by the Industrial Revolution. And we are going to identify the origins and characteristics of the free enterprise system, communism, and socialism. By the time that we are done, you will be able to analyze Karl Marx's ideas on communism and also compare and contrast capitalism, communism, and socialism. So the first industrial revolution took place in Great Britain with the introduction of the steam engine and the factory. Um, we see a second industrial revolution during which many important inventions and processes will be created. Um, Thomas Edison is credited with many um, innovations including the phonograph, the motion pictures, and also el electric light bulb. His inventions are based on electricity which result in longer work hours in factories since they no longer have to rely on sunlight and they can work into long hours thanks to the light bulb. Alexander Graham Bell invents the tele tele uh, telephone at this time and uh, Marie Curie becomes the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for her work with radioactivity and the discovery of a new element, radium. We begin to see the emergence of capitalism um, in major countries in, East, in Western Europe and in the United States. Um, capitalists are the new middle class. These are merchants, landowners, and bankers. And they're called capitalists because they have the money or the resources to invest in, in new uh, uh, businesses. And they help develop the free enterprise system, also known as capitalism. So entrepreneurs play a very important role in the capitalist system. Um, they're the ones who own the factories. They organize, manage, and assume all of the risk of a business. So if the business fails, they're the ones who lose their money. Um, they do this because they want to make profits. Workers also play a very important role. Um, during the 19th century, most of the workers were former farmers, and um, they are unskilled, meaning they are uh, they don't have a particular skill set. Uh, they can't make something. Um, they mostly uh, are only skilled at operating machines, and anybody can do that. Um, so they receive very low wages in exchange for their labor in these factories. In the 19th century, um, the government had a laissez-faire attitude towards economics. That means hands-off. Government did not interfere in the relations between workers and business owners. Um, they did not regulate work hours, they did not regulate wages, and they didn't demand that there be safe conditions in factories. Um, basically, if the government didn't interfere, then um, the business owners could do whatever they needed to to try to make the most profit. Um, family life was impacted by the Industrial Revolution. Um, like we've discussed in the previous lesson, uh, people lived in villages prior to the industrialization, and women worked in the fields together with the men or inside the home. Um, children learned from their parents, and they learned a trade usually or learned how to do something by hand. Um, after industrialization, people moved to cities in search of jobs, um, and men, women, and children all worked outside of the home to help support the family. Um, the cities became very overcrowded and dangerous, and there was less access to fresh water, sunlight, and fresh air, um, which led to the spread of diseases. We begin to see some reform movements during this time. Um, they began in Great Britain. Uh, women and children were banned from the mines uh, because they were considered too dangerous. And working hours were limited um, in some cases, so people weren't required to, wo to work too long. Um, government also demanded safer working conditions for, ch uh, for children and, and for other workers in the factories. Um, Queen Victoria, who was a very popular English monarch, um, favored these social reforms and she supported the efforts of, uh, that were made by private entities to help the poor community. Um, we also begin to see uh, reforms in the cities. These are known as municipal reforms. Um, these, these new changes made cities cleaner and healthier. Um, they improved the quality of the drinking water for the citizens and also introduced a sewer system to keep the, the cities um, more sanitary. Um, the cities were also made safer by employing more police officers and installing street lamps so uh, burglaries and, and 
muggings would be reduced um, and they also introduced the free public school um, ele uh, for children uh, of elementary age. Workers began to organize into unions. Um, these are organizations that uh, fight for better wages and conditions. Um, they threatened to strike if these uh, demands were not met and um, they became a very powerful force during this time. Um, we see a lot of political reforms as well. The middle class will begin to demand more political participation and um, the Reform Bill of 1832, for example, gave more representation and voting rights to the middle class in Great Britain. Um, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels um, write a very uh, influential book during this time. It's uh, called The Communist Manifesto in 1848, and um, they are great critics of, cra of, ca of the capitalist system. They believe that workers um, created value through their labor, and um, they weren't fairly compensated. Instead, they were exploited. And so um, they predicted that workers would eventually get fed up of this system, rise up in a violent revolution, overthrow the upper classes, and establish an equal society that would live in perfect harmony. This is the idea of communism. That brings us to the next journal entry. The following excerpt is adapted from Ma Marx and Engels' The Communist Manifesto, which was written in 1848. It says, The history of all existing society is the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a world, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted open fight, a fight that each time ended, either in a revolutionary, revolutionary reconstitution of society or in the common ruin of the opposing classes. Communists do not conceal their vies and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be reached only by only the overthrow of existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communist revolution. The pro proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. So how does Marx view the past? Use an example from the text in your answer, then explain what he predicts will happen in the future. So if we analyze this text at the beginning, he is describing a lot of historical events. Um, the He's talking about free man versus slaves. Here he's talking about the patricians versus the plebeians in ancient Rome. Um, he's talking about lords and serfs during uh, the, the Middle Ages in, in the system of feudalism. Um, so he is saying that history has always been a constant struggle between the oppressor and the oppressed. Um, and eventually he says that everybody grows tired of being oppressed and will rise up in a revolution. So he is describing all the revolutions that have taken place over time. And it's always been because the oppressed get tired of being oppressed and are going to rise up in a war against the oppressor. Um, that's how he describes history. So what is he predicting is going to happen? That the working men who are now the new oppressed people are also going to rise in a, in a violent revolution th to overthrow their oppressor. Right? So take some time to analyze the excerpt and write those um, ideas in your own words. Okay, so let's talk about another um, movement during this time, the uh, birth of socialism. Um, government, uh, socialists believe, um, should pass laws to protect workers. They believe that the government should own some businesses, and they also believe that the government should provide free education, low-cost housing, public transportation, and universal health care. Um, one of the biggest difference between socialists and communists is that socialists don't believe in violent revolutions. They believe in taking political action. So uh, they're going to try to get a lot of people elected into the government or they're going to try to draw attention to their causes either through protest um, or petitions, um, things like that. Okay, so um, you have a, an organizer to help you see the difference between um, these three economic system. So we'll start with capitalism. In capitalism, the individual is the most important um, part of society. Um, goods belong to the individual, the community is supported by volunteers, and the government is small. That means they don't interfere in, in the business world. Um, prices are determined by supply and demand. Um, the more that something is, is uh, demanded, the higher the price will be. Um, if, if there's a, a large supply of something, then prices usually tend to decline. 
In a socialist system, the community is most important. Goods are owned by the community, the individual is very small, and the government is big. The, there's a big influence of, of the government in business. Um, the community has the right to food and housing, and the government has the obligation to provide that. In a communist system, the government is the most important. Um, goods belong to the government. Everything belongs to the government. Community is supported by the government. The individual is small, and there is no private property. So there's no private ownership in a communist system. Everything belongs to the government. All decisions are also made by the government for the good of the community. All right, that brings us to the end of the slideshow. If you have any questions, uh, bring them to class, and thank you for watching.